The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, Section 1, Continued. Cassette 8, Side 1. The door opened and a portly stranger, an old man with a white beard, entered the house. He crossed himself at the icon there, looked sternly at Beloff and said to him, Hail, Mikhail, God gives you his blessing. Beloff replied, My name is Victor. But, the old man continued, you are destined to become Mikhail, the Emperor of Holy Russia. Just then, Victor's mother returned and half collapsed in fright, spilling her pails. It was the very same old man who had come to her twenty-seven years before. He had turned white in the meantime, but it was he. God bless you, Pelageya, you have preserved your son, said the old man. And he took the future emperor aside, like a patriarch preparing to enthrone him, and announced to the astonished young man that in 1953 there would be a change in rule and that he would become emperor of all Russia. The prophetic old man made only one mistake. He confused the chauffeur with his former employer. That is why the number of our cell, 53, shocked him so. To this end, the old man told him, he was to begin to gather his forces in 1948. The old man didn't instruct him as to how to gather his forces. He departed, and Viktor Alexeyevich didn't get around to asking. All the peace and simplicity of his life were lost to him now. Perhaps some other individual would have recoiled from the ambitious program, but Viktor, as it happened, had rubbed shoulders with the highest of the high. He had seen all those Mikhailovs, Sherbakovs, Sedins, and he had heard a lot from other chauffeurs, too, and he had gotten it clear in his own mind that nothing in the least unusual was required, in fact, just the reverse. The newly anointed Tsar, quiet, conscientious, sensitive, like Fyodor Ivanovich, the last of the line of Ryurik, felt on his brow the heavy pressure of the crown of Monomach. All around him were the people's poverty and grief, for which he had not until now borne any responsibility. Now all this lay upon his shoulders, and he was to blame for the fact that this misery still existed. It seemed strange to him to wait until 1948, and therefore, in that very autumn of 1943, he wrote his first proclamation to the Russian people and read it to four of his fellow workers in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum. We had surrounded Viktor Alexeyevich from early morning, and he had meekly told us all this. We had still not fathomed his childish trustfulness. We were absorbed in his unusual story, and it was our fault. We forgot to warn him about the stoolie. In fact, we never even thought for one minute that there was anything in the naive and simple story he had told us that the interrogator didn't already know. The instant the story ended, Kramarenko began demanding to be taken either to the chief of the prison for tobacco or else to the doctor. At any rate, they summoned him quickly. And as soon as he got there, he put the finger on those four workers in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum, whose existence no one would ever have suspected. The next day, returning from his interrogation, Beloff was astonished that the interrogator knew about them. And that's when it hit us. Those workers had heard the proclamation and approved it all, and no one had turned in the emperor. But he himself felt that it was too early, and he burned it. A year passed. Viktor Alexeyevich was working as a mechanic in the garage of an automobile depot. In the fall of 1944, he again wrote a proclamation and gave it to ten people to read, chauffeurs and lathe operators. All of them approved it, and no one turned him in. It was a surprising thing, indeed, that not one person in that group of ten had turned him in, in that period of ubiquitous stool pigeons. Fastenko had not been mistaken in his deductions about the mood of the working class. True, in this case the emperor had used some innocent tricks. He had thrown out hints that a strong arm inside the government was on his side, and he had promised his supporters travel assignments to rally monarchic sentiment at the grassroots. Months went by. The emperor entrusted his secret to two girls at the garage. But this time there was no misfire. These girls turned out to be ideologically sound, and Viktor Alexeyevich's heart sank. He had a premonition of disaster. On the Sunday after the Annunciation, 
he went to the market carrying the proclamation with him. One of his sympathizers among the old workers saw him there and said, Victor, you ought to burn that piece of paper for the time being. How about it? And Victor felt clearly that he had written it too soon and that he should burn it. I'll burn it right now, you're right. And he started home to burn it. But right there in the market, two pleasant young men called out to him, Victor Alexeyevich, come along with us. And they took him to the Lubyanka in a private car. When they got him there, they had been in such a hurry and were so excited that they didn't search him in the usual way, and there was a moment when the emperor almost destroyed his proclamation in the toilet. But he decided that it would be the worst for him, that they would keep after him anyway to find out where it was, and they straight away took him in an elevator up to a general and a colonel, and the general with his own hands grabbed the proclamation from Victor's pocket. However, it took only one interrogation for the big Lubyanka to quiet down again. It turned out to be not so dangerous. Ten arrests in the garage of the auto depot and four in the garage of the People's Commissariat of Petroleum. The interrogation was turned over to a lieutenant colonel who had a good laugh as he went through the proclamation. You write here, Your Majesty. In the first spring I will instruct my Minister of Agriculture to dissolve the collective farms. But how are you going to divide up the tools and livestock? You haven't got it worked out yet. And then you also write, I am going to increase housing construction and house each person next to the place he works, and I am going to raise all the workers' wages. And where are you going to find the money, Your Majesty? Are you going to have to run the money off on printing presses? You are going to abolish the state loans. And then, too, I am going to wipe the Kremlin from the face of the earth. But where are you going to put your own government? What about the building of the big Lubyanka? Would you like to take a tour of inspection and look it over? Many of the younger interrogators also stopped by to make fun of the emperor of all Russia. They saw nothing except comedy in all this. And it was not always easy for us in the cell to keep a straight face. We hope you aren't going to forget us here in cell number 53, said Z blank V, winking at the rest of us. Everyone laughed at him. Viktor Alexeyevich, with his white eyebrows and innocent simplicity and his calloused hands, would treat us when he received boiled potatoes from his unfortunate mother, Pelageya, without ever dividing them into yours and mine. Come on, comrades, eat up, eat up. He used to smile shyly. He understood perfectly well how uncontemporary and funny all this was, to be the emperor of all Russia. But what could he do if God's choice had fallen on him? They soon removed him from our cell. When they introduced me to Khrushchev in 1962, I wanted to say to him, Nikita Sergeyevich, you and I have an acquaintance in common. But I told him something else, more urgent, on behalf of former prisoners. Just before May the 1st, they took down the blackout shade on the window. The war was perceptibly coming to an end. That evening it was quieter than ever before in the Lubyanka. It was, I remember, almost like the second day of Easter, since May Day and Easter came one after the other that year. All the interrogators were out in Moscow celebrating. No one was taken to interrogation. In the silence we could hear someone across the corridor protesting. They took him from the cell and into a box. By listening we could detect the location of all the doors. They left the door of the box open and they kept beating him a long time. In the suspended silence every blow on his soft and choking mouth could be heard clearly. On May the 2nd, a 30-gun salute roared out. That meant a European capital. Only two had not yet been captured, Prague and Berlin. We tried to guess which it was. On the 9th of May, they brought us our dinner at the same time as our lunch, which was done at the Lubyanka only on May the 1st and November the 7th. And that is how we guessed that the war had ended. That evening, they shot off another 30-gun salute. We then knew that there were no more capitals to be captured, and later that same evening one more salute roared out, forty guns, I seem to remember, and that was the end of all the ends. Above the muzzle of our window, and from all the other cells of the Lubyanka, and from all the windows of all the Moscow prisons, we, too, former prisoners of war and former front-line soldiers, watched the Moscow heavens, 
patterned with fireworks and crisscrossed by the beams of searchlights. Boris Gamarov, a young anti-tank man, already demobilized because of wounds, with an incurable wound in his lung, having been arrested with a group of students, was in prison that evening in an overcrowded Butyrki cell, where half the inmates were former POWs and frontline soldiers. He described this last salute of the war in a terse eight-stanza poem in the most ordinary language. How they were already lying down on their board bunks, covered with their overcoats. How they were awakened by the noise. How they raised their heads, squinted up at the muzzle. Oh, it's just a salute. And then lay down again. And once again covered themselves with their coats with those same overcoats which had been in the clay of the trenches and the ashes of bonfires and been torn to tatters by German shell fragments. That victory was not for us, and that spring was not for us either. Chapter 6 That Spring Through the windows of the Butyrki prison every morning and evening in June 1945, we could hear the brassy notes of bands not far away, coming from either Lesnaya Street or Novoslobodskaya. They kept playing marches over and over. Behind the murky green muzzles of reinforced glass, we stood at the wide-open but impenetrable prison windows and listened. Were they military units that were marching, or were they workers cheerfully devoting their free time to marching practice? We didn't know, but the rumour had already gotten through to us that preparations were underway for a big victory parade on Red Square on June the 22nd, the fourth anniversary of the beginning of the war. The foundation stones of a great building are destined to groan and be pressed upon. It is not for them to crown the edifice, but even the honour of being part of the foundation was denied those whose doomed heads and ribs had borne the first blows of this war and thwarted the foreigners' victory and who were now abandoned for no good reason. Joyful sounds mean naught to the traitor. That spring of 1945 was, in our prisons, predominantly the spring of the Russian prisoners of war. They passed through the prisons of the Soviet Union in vast, dense grey shoals like ocean herring. The first trace of those schools I glimpsed was Yuri Y, but I was soon entirely surrounded by their purposeful motion, which seemed to know its own fated design. Not only war prisoners passed through those cells, a wave of those who had spent any time in Europe was rolling too. Emigres from the Civil War, the Ostovtsi, workers recruited as labourers by the Germans during World War II, Red Army officers who had been too astute and far-sighted in their conclusions, so that Stalin feared they might bring European freedom back from their European crusade, like the Decembrists 120 years before. And yet, it was the war prisoners who constituted the bulk of the wave, and among the war prisoners of various ages, most were of my own age, not precisely my age, but the twins of October, those born along with the revolution, who in 1937 had poured forth undismayed to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the revolution, and whose age group, at the beginning of the war, made up the standing army, which had been scattered in a matter of weeks. That tedious prison spring had, to the tune of the victory marches, become the spring of reckoning for my whole generation. Over our cradles, the rallying cry had resounded, All power to the Soviets! It was we who had reached out our sun-tanned, childish hands to clutch the pioneer's bugle, and who, in response to the pioneer challenge, be prepared had saluted and answered, We are always prepared. It was we who had smuggled weapons into Buchenwald and joined the Communist Party there. And it was we who were now in disgrace, only because we had survived. Those prisoners who had been in Buchenwald and survived were in fact imprisoned for that very reason in our own camps. How could you have survived an annihilation camp? Something doesn't smell right. Back when the Red Army had cut through East Prussia, I had seen downcast columns of returning war prisoners, the only people around who were grieving instead of celebrating. Even then their gloom had shocked me, though I didn't yet grasp the reason for it. 
I jumped down and went over to those voluntarily formed up columns. Why were they marching in columns? Why had they lined themselves up in ranks? After all, no one had compelled them to, and the war prisoners of all other nations went home as scattered individuals. But ours wanted to return as submissively as possible. I was wearing a captain's shoulder boards, and they, plus the fact that I was moving forward, helped prevent my finding out why our POWs were so sad. But then fate turned me around and sent me in the wake of those prisoners along the same path they had taken. I had already marched with them from Army Counterintelligence Headquarters to the headquarters at the front. And when we got there, I had heard their first stories, which I didn't yet understand. And then Yuri Y told me the whole thing. And here, beneath the domes of the brick-red Butyrki Castle, I felt that the story of these several million Russian prisoners had got me in its grip once and for all like a pin through a specimen beetle. My own story of landing in prison seemed insignificant. I stopped regretting my torn-off shoulder boards. It was mere chance that had kept me from ending up exactly where these contemporaries of mine had ended. I came to understand that it was my duty to take upon my shoulders a share of their common burden, and to bear it to the last man until it crushed us. I now felt as if I too had fallen prisoner at the Solovyev crossing, in the Kharkov encirclement, in the quarries of Kirch, and hands behind my back had carried my Soviet pride behind the barbed wire of the concentration camps. That I, too, had stood for hours in the freezing cold for a ladle of cold kawa, an ersatz coffee, and had been left on the ground for dead without even reaching the kettle. That in Oflag 68, Suwalki, I had used my hands and the lid of a mess tin to dig a bell-shaped upturned, that is, foxhole, so as not to have to spend the winter on the open field, and that a maddened prisoner had crawled up to me as I lay dying to gnaw on the still warm flesh beneath my arm, and with every new day of exacerbated famished consciousness, lying in a barracks riddled with typhus, or at the barbed wire of the neighboring camp for English POWs, the clear thought had penetrated my dying brain. Soviet, Russia, has renounced her dying children. She had needed them, proud sons of Russia, as long as they let the tanks roll over them, and it was still possible to rouse them to attack. But to feed them, once they were war prisoners, extra mouths, and extra witnesses to humiliating defeats. Sometimes we try to lie, but our tongue will not allow us to. These people were labelled traitors, but a remarkable slip of the tongue occurred, on the part of the judges, prosecutors, and interrogators. And the convicted prisoners, the entire nation, and the newspapers repeated and reinforced this mistake in voluntarily letting the truth out of the bag. They intended to declare them traitors to the motherland, but they were universally referred to in speech and in writing, even in the court documents, as traitors of the motherland. You said it. They were not traitors to her, they were her traitors. It was not they, the unfortunates who had betrayed the motherland, but their calculating motherland who had betrayed them, and not just once, but thrice. The first time she betrayed them was on the battlefield, through ineptitude, when the government so beloved by the motherland did everything it could to lose the war, destroyed the lines of fortifications, set up the whole air force for annihilation, dismantled the tanks and artillery, removed the effective generals, and forbade the armies to resist. Now, after 27 years, the first honest work on this subject has appeared. P. G. Grigorenko, a letter to the magazine Problems of the History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Samizdat, 1968. And such works are going to multiply from here on out. Not all the witnesses died and soon no one will call Stalin's government anything but a government of insanity and treason. And the war prisoners were the men whose bodies took the blow and stopped the Wehrmacht. The second time they were heartlessly betrayed by the motherland was when she abandoned them to die in captivity. And the third time they were unscrupulously betrayed was when, with motherly love, she coaxed them to return home with such phrases as, The motherland has forgiven you. The motherland calls you, and snared them the moment they reached the frontiers.
One of the biggest war criminals, Colonel General Golikov, former chief of the Red Army's intelligence administration, was put in charge of coaxing the repatriates home and swallowing them up. It would appear that during the 1,100 years of Russia's existence as a state, there have been, ah, how many foul and terrible deeds. But among them, was there ever so multi-millioned foul a deed as this, to betray one's own soldiers and proclaim them traitors? How easily we left them out of our own accounting. He was a traitor. For shame, write him off. And our father wrote them off, even before we did. He threw the flower of Moscow's intelligentsia into the Vyadzma meat grinder with Berdan single-loading rifles, vintage 1866, and only one for every five men at that. What Lev Tolstoy is going to describe that Borodino for us? And with one stupid sliver of his greasy, stubby finger, the great strategist sent 120,000 of our young men, almost as many as all the Russian forces at Borodino, across the Strait of Kerch in December 1941, senselessly and exclusively for the sake of a sensational New Year's communique, and he turned them all over to the Germans without a fight. And yet, for some reason, it was not he who was the traitor, but they... How easily we let ourselves be taken in by partisan labels. How easily we agreed to regard these devoted men as traitors. In one of the Butyrki cells that spring, there was an old man, Lebedev, a metallurgist, a professor in rank, and an appearance of stalwart artisan of the last century, or maybe even the century before, from, say, the famous Demidov iron foundries. He was broad of shoulder, broad of head wore a Pugachev-like beard, and the wide span of his hand could lift a 150-pound bucket. In the cell he wore a faded grey labourer's smock over his underwear. He was slovenly and might have been an auxiliary prison worker. Until he sat down to read, and then his habitual powerful intelligence lit up his face. The men often gathered around him. He discussed metallurgy very little but explained to us in his kettle-drum-bass voice that Stalin was exactly the same kind of dog as Ivan the Terrible. Shoot! Strangle! Don't hesitate! He explained to us also that Maxim Gorky had been a slobbering prattler, an apologist for executioners. I was very much taken with this Lebedev. It was as though the whole Russian people were embodied there before my eyes, in that one thick-set torso with that intelligent head and the arms and legs of a plowman. He had already thought through so much. I learned from him to understand the world. And suddenly, with a chopping gesture of his huge hand, he thundered out that those charged under Article 58.1b were traitors of the motherland and must not be forgiven. And those very same 1b's were piled up on the board bunks all around and how hurtful to them this was. The old man was pontificating with such conviction in the name of Russia's peasantry and labor that they were abashed and found it hard to defend themselves against the attack from this new direction. I was the one to whom it fell, along with two boys charged under 5810, to defend them and to argue with the old man. But what depths of enforced ignorance were achieved by the monstrous lies of the state... Even the most broad-minded of us can embrace only that part of the truth into which our own snout has blundered. Witkowski writes about this on the basis of the thirties in more general terms. It was astonishing that the pseudo-wreckers, who knew perfectly well that they weren't wreckers, believed that military men and priests were being shaken up justifiably. The military men, who knew they hadn't worked for foreign intelligence services and had not sabotaged the Red Army believed readily enough that the engineers were wreckers and that the priests deserved to be destroyed. In prison, the Soviet person reasoned in the following way. I personally am innocent, but any methods are justified in dealing with those others, the enemies. The lessons of interrogation and the cell failed to enlighten such people. Even after they themselves had been convicted, they retained the blind beliefs of their days in freedom, Belief in universal conspiracies, poisonings, wreckings, espionage. How many wars Russia has been involved in? It would have been better if there had been fewer. 
And were there many traitors in all those wars? Had anyone observed that treason had become deeply rooted in the hearts of Russian soldiers? Then, under the most just social system in the world, came the most just war of all, and out of nowhere millions of traitors appeared, from among the simplest, lowliest elements of the population. How is this to be understood and explained? Capitalist England fought at our side against Hitler. Marx had eloquently described the poverty and suffering of the working class in that same England. Why was it that in this war only one traitor could be found among them, the businessman Lord Haw Haw? But in our country, millions. It is frightening to open one's trap about this, but might the heart of the matter not be in the political system? One of our most ancient proverbs justifies the war prisoner. The captive will cry out, but the dead man never. During the reign of Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, nobility was granted for durance in captivity, and in all subsequent wars it was considered society's duty to exchange prisoners, to comfort one's own and to give them sustenance and aid. Every escape from captivity was glorified as the height of heroism. Throughout World War I, money was collected in Russia to aid our prisoners of war, and our nurses were permitted to go to Germany to help our prisoners, and our newspapers reminded their readers daily that our prisoners of war, our compatriots, were languishing in evil captivity. All the Western peoples behaved the same in our war. Parcels, letters, all kinds of assistance flowed freely through the neutral countries. The Western POWs did not have to lower themselves to accept ladlefuls from German soup kettles. They talked back to the German guards. Western governments gave their captured soldiers their seniority rights, their regular promotions, even their pay. The only soldier in the world who cannot surrender is the soldier of the world's one and only Red Army. That's what it says in our military statutes. The Germans would shout at us from their trenches, Ivan, play nicht! Ivan, no prisoner. Who can picture all that means? There is war, there is death, but there is no surrender. What a discovery. What it means is, go and die, we will go on living. And if you lose your legs, yet manage to return from captivity on crutches, we will convict you. The Leningrader Ivanov, commander of a machine gun platoon in the Finnish war, was subsequently thus imprisoned in Ustvimelag, for example. Our soldiers alone, renounced by their motherland and degraded to nothing in the eyes of enemies and allies, had to push their way to the swine swill being doled out in the backyards of the Third Reich. Our soldiers alone had the doors shut tight to keep them from returning to their homes, although their young souls tried hard not to believe this. There was something called Article 58 1B, and in wartime it provided only for execution by shooting. For not wanting to die from a German bullet, the prisoner had to die from a Soviet bullet for having been a prisoner of war. Some get theirs from the enemy, and we get it from our own. Incidentally, it is very naive to say, what for? At no time have governments been moralists. They never imprisoned people and executed them for having done something. They imprisoned and executed them to keep them from doing something. They imprisoned all those POWs, of course, not for treason to the motherland, because it was absolutely clear even to a fool that only the Vlasov men could be accused of treason. They imprisoned all of them to keep them from telling their fellow villagers about Europe. What the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't grieve for. What, then, were the courses of action open to Russian war prisoners? There was only one legally acceptable course, to lie down and let oneself be trampled to death. Every blade of grass pushes its fragile length upward in order to live. As for you, lie down and be trampled on. Even though you've been slow about it, even though you couldn't do it on the battlefield, at least die now, then you will not be prosecuted. The soldiers sleep. They spoke their word, and they are right for eternity. And every other path which, in desperation, your mind may invent is going to lead you into conflict with the law. Escape and return to the motherland, past the guards ringing the camp, across half Germany, then through Poland or the Balkans, led straight to Smirsch and prison. They were asked, 
How did you manage to escape when others couldn't? This stinks. Come on, you rat. What assignment did they give you? Mikhail Bernatsev, Pavel Bondarenko, and many, many others. It has become the accepted thing for our literary critics to say that Sholokov, in his immortal story Sudbar Chelofika, The Fate of a Man, spoke the bitter truth about this side of our life and that he revealed the problem. But we must retort that in this story, which is in general very inferior and in which the passages about the war are pale and unconvincing, since the author evidently knew nothing about the last war, and the descriptions of Germans are unconvincing cartoon clichés, only the hero's wife was successfully portrayed, because she is a pure Christian straight out of Dostoevsky. In this story about a war prisoner, the real problem of the war prisoners was hidden or distorted. One, the author picked the least incriminating form of being taken prisoner conceivable. The soldier was captured while unconscious so as to make him non-controversial and to bypass the whole poignancy of the problem. What if he had been conscious when he was taken prisoner, as was most often the case? What would have happened to him then? Two, the fact that the motherland had deserted us, had renounced us, had cursed us, was not presented as the war prisoner's chief problem. Sholokov says not a word about it. But it was because of that particular factor that there was no way out. On the contrary, he identifies the presence of traitors among us as constituting the problem. But if this really was the main thing, one might then expect him to have investigated further and explained where they came from a full quarter century after a revolution that was supported by the entire people. 3. Sholokov dreamed up a fantastic spy story escape from captivity, stretching innumerable points to avoid the obligatory inevitable procedural step of the returned war prisoner's reception in Smirsch, the identification and screening camp. Not only was Sokolov, the hero, not put behind barbed wire, as provided in the regulations, but, and this is a real joke, he was given a month's holiday by his colonel. In other words, the freedom to carry out the assignment given him by the fascist intelligence service. So his colonel would end up in the same place as he. Escaping to the Western Partisans, to the resistance forces, only postponed your full reckoning with the military tribunal. Also, it made you still more dangerous. You could have acquired a very harmful spirit through living freely among Europeans, and if you had not been afraid to escape and continue to fight, it meant you were a determined person and thus doubly dangerous in the motherland. Did you survive POW camp at the expense of your compatriots and comrades? Did you become a member of the camp polizei, or a commandant, a helper of the Germans and of death? Stalinist law did not punish you any more severely than if you had operated with the resistance forces. It was the same article of the code and the same term. And one could guess why, too. Such a person was less dangerous. But the inert law that is inexplicably implanted in us forbade this path to all except the dregs. In addition to those four possibilities either impossible or unacceptable, there was a fifth, to wait for German recruiters to see what they would summon you to. Sometimes, fortunately, representatives came from German rural districts to select hired men for their farmers. Sometimes they came from corporations and picked out engineers and mechanics. According to the supreme Stalinist imperative, you should have rejected that too. You should have concealed the fact that you were an engineer. You should have concealed the fact that you were a skilled worker. As an industrial designer or electrician, you could have preserved your patriotic purity only if you had stayed in the POW camp to dig in the earth, to rot, to pick through the garbage heap. In that case, for pure treason to the motherland, you could count on getting, your head raised high in pride, ten years in prison and five more muzzled. Whereas for treason to the motherland, aggravated by working for the enemy, especially in one's own profession, you've got, with bowed head, the same ten years in prison and five more muzzled. And that was the jeweller's precision of a beer moth, Stalin's trademark. Now and then, recruiters turned up who were of quite a different type. Russians, usually recent communist political commissars. White guards didn't accept that type of employment. These recruiters scheduled a meeting in the camp, condemned the Soviet regime, and appealed to prisoners to enlist in spy schools or in Vlazov units. <laughs>
People who have never starved, as our war prisoners did, who have never gnawed on bats that happened to fly into the barracks, who have never had to boil the soles of old shoes, will never understand the irresistible material force exerted by any kind of appeal, any kind of argument whatever, if behind it, on the other side of the camp gates, smoke rises from a field kitchen, and if everyone who signs up is fed a belly full of kasha right then and there, if only once, just once more before I die. And hovering over the steaming kasha and the inducements of the recruiter was the apparition of freedom and a real life, wherever it might call, to the Vlasov battalions, to the Cossack regiments of Krasnov, to the labor battalions pouring cement in the future Atlantic Wall, to the fjords of Norway, to the sands of Libya, to the Hiwi unit, Hilfsfilliger, volunteers in the German Wehrmacht, there being twelve Hiwi men in each German company. And then, finally, to the village Polizei, who pursued and caught partisans, many of whom the motherland would also renounce. Wherever it might call, any place at all, at least anything, so as not to stay there and die like abandoned cattle. We ourselves, released from every obligation, not merely to his motherland, but to all humanity, the human being whom we drove to gnawing on bats. And those of our boys who agreed to become half-baked spies still had not drawn any drastic conclusions from their abandoned state. They were still, in fact, acting very patriotically. They saw this course as the least difficult means of getting out of POW camp. Almost to a man, they decided that as soon as the Germans sent them across to the Soviet side, they would turn themselves in to the authorities, turn in their equipment and instructions, and join their own benign command in laughing at the stupid Germans. They would then put on their Red Army uniforms and return to fight bravely in their units. And tell me, who, speaking in human terms, could have expected anything else? How could it have been any other way? These were straightforward, sincere men. I saw many of them. They had honest, round faces and spoke with an attractive Vyatka or Vladimir accent. They boldly joined up as spies, even though they'd had only four or five grades of rural school, and were not even competent to cope with map and compass. It appears that they picked the only way out they could, and one would suppose that the whole thing was an expensive and stupid game on the part of the German command. But no, Hitler played in rhythm and in tune with his brother dictator. Spy mania was one of the fundamental aspects of Stalin's insanity. It seemed to Stalin that the country was swarming with spies. All the Chinese who lived in the Soviet Far East were convicted as spies, Article 58, 6, and were taken to the northern camps where they perished. The same fate had awaited Chinese participants in the Soviet Civil War, if they hadn't cleared out in time. Several hundred thousand Koreans were exiled to Kazakhstan, all similarly accused of spying. All Soviet citizens who at one time or another had lived abroad, who at one time or another had hung around in tourist hotels, who at one time or another happened to be photographed next to a foreigner, or who had themselves photographed a city building, the Golden Gate in Vladimir, were accused of the same crime. Those who stared too long at railroad tracks, at a highway bridge, at a factory chimney, were similarly charged. All the numerous foreign communists stranded in the Soviet Union, all the big and little Comintern officials and employees, one after another, without any individual distinctions, were charged, first of all, with espionage. Iosip Tito just barely escaped this fate, and Popov and Tanev, fellow defendants of Dimitrov in the Leipzig trial, both got prison terms. For Dimitrov himself, Stalin prepared another fate. And the Latvian riflemen, whose bayonets were the most reliable in the first years of the revolution, were also accused of espionage when they were arrested to a man in 1937. Stalin seems somehow to have twisted around and maximized the famous declaration of that coquette Catherine the Great. He would rather that 999 innocent men should rot than miss one genuine spy. Given all this... How could one believe and trust Russian soldiers who had really been in the hands of the German intelligence service? And how it eased the burden for the MGB executioners when thousands of soldiers pouring in from Europe did not even try to conceal that they had voluntarily enlisted as spies?
What an astonishing confirmation of the predictions of the wisest of the wise. Come on, keep coming, you silly fools. The article and the retribution have long since been waiting for you. But it is appropriate to ask one thing more. There still were prisoners of war who did not accept recruiting offers, who never worked for the Germans at their profession or trade, and who were not camp police, who spent the whole war in POW camps without sticking their noses outside, and who, in spite of everything, did not die, however unlikely this was. For example, they made cigarette lighters out of scrap metal, like the electrical engineers Nikolai Andreevich Semyonov and Fyodor Fyodorovich Karpov, and in that way managed to get enough to eat. And did the motherland forgive them for surrendering? No, it did not forgive them. I met both Semyonov and Karpov in the Butyrki after they had already received their lawful sentence. And what was it? The alert reader already knows. Ten years of imprisonment and five muzzled. As brilliant engineers, they had rejected German offers to work at their profession. In 1941, junior Lieutenant Semyonov had gone to the front as a volunteer. In 1942, he still didn't have a revolver. Instead, he had an empty holster, and the interrogator could not understand why he hadn't shot himself with his holster. He had escaped from captivity three times, and in 1945, after he had been liberated from a concentration camp, seated atop a tank as a member of a penalty unit of tank-borne infantry, he took part in the capture of Berlin and received the Order of the Red Star. Yet, after all that, he was finally imprisoned and sentenced. All of this mirrored our nemesis. Very few of the war prisoners returned across the Soviet border as free men, and if one happened to get through by accident because of the prevailing chaos, he was seized later on, even as late as 1946 or 1947. Some were arrested at assembly points in Germany. Others weren't arrested openly right away, but were transported from the border in freight cars under convoy to one of the numerous identification and screening camps, PFLs, scattered throughout the country. These camps differed in no way from the common run of corrective labor camps, ITLs, except that their prisoners had not yet been sentenced, but would be sentenced there. All these PFLs were also attached to some kind of factory or mine or construction project, and the former POWs, looking out on the motherland newly restored to them through the same barbed wire through which they had seen Germany, could begin work from their first day on a ten-hour workday. Those under suspicion were questioned during their rest periods, in the evenings and at night, and there were large numbers of security officers and interrogators in the PFL for this purpose. As always, the interrogation began with the hypothesis that you were obviously guilty, and you, without going outside the barbed wire, had to prove that you were not guilty. Your only available means to this end was to rely on witnesses who were exactly the same kind of POWs as you. Obviously, they might not have turned up in your own PFL. They might, in fact, be at the other end of the country. In that case, the security officers of, say, Kemerovo would send off inquiries to the security officers of Solikamsk, who would question the witnesses and send back their answers along with new inquiries, and you yourself would be questioned as a witness in some other case. True, it might take a year or two before your fate was resolved, but after all, the motherland was losing nothing in the process. You were out mining coal every day, and if one of your witnesses gave the wrong sort of testimony about you, or if none of your witnesses was alive, you had only yourself to blame, and you were sure to be entered in the documents as a traitor of the motherland. And the visiting military court would rubber stamp your tenor. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.